Thank you all for coming, many of you coming again, and new faces as well. In my first le lecture, I spoke of the possibility of freedom of choice and of the long historical struggles between ideas of free choice on the one hand and deterministic theories on the other. I looked in particular at contemporary scientific perspectives, many of which, though not all, rule out the possibility of genuine freedom of choice, all the while accepting the practical usefulness of the concept of free choice in human affairs. Conscious experience of free choice may be illusory and deceptive, as some scientists conclude, because unconscious psychological processes, as well as non-conscious electrical and chemical processes in the brain, ultimately determine our choices and our actions. Yet, we must deal with consciousness, even if it is only the tip of the iceberg, as I said last week. A tip that is uh, dependent for its own activation on the physical power and support of the hidden part of the iceberg in the brain. Whatever conscious awareness is, it is not unimportant to us, not a trivial add-on to our nature. It's that aspect of our existence through which we know, at least in part, who we are and what we ought to do. It's not superfluous, therefore, to ask again and again whether conscious experience can yield insights about free choice, not only illusions. If my first lecture was about whether or not there is human free freedom of choice, this second lecture is about two things. First, the givens in our conscious awareness of decision making. And second, the meaning of choice itself. More specifically, it's first about what we choose when we choose. And second, about what we are doing when we are choosing. The whole point of this lecture takes some inspiration from St. Augustine's conviction that it's not necessary to tell anyone to love. Everyone loves someone or something. The important question he came to believe is what and how to love. This implies, I take it, that at least to some extent, we choose our loves and our ways of loving. But how can this be so? I began in the last part of my previous lecture to do a descriptive analysis of the conscious experience of free choice. Two fairly evident assumptions belong to such an analysis. First, since we are exploring free choice in our conscious experience, we're looking for elements available to us at the conscious level. And second, since we are exploring an experience of choice, we need at least two alternative objects for choice, two, at least two alternative options for choice. Hence, although I frequently refer to an object of choice, the presumption is that there is always an alternative object as well, and that these remain in tension with one another until one of them is chosen. So I'm going to return now to that analysis. I took only the first step in it last time. My approach to an understanding of the experience of free choice was and is through an analysis of its object, that is, of what we choose when we choose. I said then that with this approach, I'm not looking for particular persons, things, states of affairs that each of us might choose, although the importance of these will be clear, I think, at least in some of the examples I use. 
Rather, I'm searching for consistent elements that are part of every object of our choice. I argued in my first lecture that in the content of the object of every choice, there is a, the element of an action to be chosen. In other words, where, whenever we make a choice, it is always a choice of an action. For example, it means nothing to say, I choose this book rather than that, unless I mean that I choose to read this book rather than that one, or to buy this book, or sell this book, or keep this one in my library rather than that one. Nothing happens. Nothing is effected. Choice is an empty term unless it has as its object an action of our own. A potential action, however, is only one of the elements of every object of choice. Today, I'm going to try to describe the manifold of elements that make up the rest of the content of an object for choice. And I'm going to ask you to do as I did last time. If you could all think of an experience of making a choice that you have made, and it probably should be an important one because the elements will be clearer if it's an important choice that you've made. And then I'm going to try to de describe what's going on. And you can test then whether what I'm saying in this description makes any sense or not. So again, then, to the object of free choice. Recognition of action as a first element in the object for choice can itself lead to the discovery of other elements. As I tried to show in my lecture last week, not just any action can be the object of free choice. The action to be chosen must be an action of my own, internal or external, an action in the present, and an action at least perceived by me as possible. But there's something more that characterizes such an action, something that leads our attention more deeply into a complex structure of affections and judgments that are also elements in the object of choice. The something more is that every action that can be chosen by us is an action that we desire to perform. We are actually unable to choose an action that we do not in some way and for some reason want to do. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're able to choose only actions that we feel like doing. Desire, in the sense I'm using the term desire to perform an action, means an affective leaning, an inclination, a being drawn to and tending toward a particular action. And I'm not limiting the meaning of desire as it's often limited in various contexts and in the work of various writers. I mean, sometimes it's limited to a sensuous affection as opposed to something more spiritual. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's uh, identified as a selfish affective uh, inclination. Uh, sometimes the, the, the actual Latin derivation, desiderare, signals a longing for the stars, really, sede stars. Uh, and uh, the Greek term eros is often used for, translated in English as desire, and often means uh, love for something that we don't yet possess. I'm not placing any of those limitations on the meaning of desire. Desire, as I use the term here, is simply an affective tendency, an emotional tendency, if you will. But there are all kinds of problems with terms like emotion, too. But uh, as opposed to simply an intellectual uh, interest, 
an affective tendency towards someone or something, and in this context, an affective tendency to perform some action. Of course, this desire can be based simply on my wanting to do this action because I feel like it, but desires can also rise out of a sense of duty or fear or a concern for someone else. Clearly, we have experiences of desiring to do some actions out of a sense of responsibility or because we believe that others want us to do them, even if we would, from the standpoint of other desires of ours, prefer to do something else. It would be a mistake to interpret such experiences as if they are choices of duty, not desire, or choices of what we do not want to do versus what we do want to do. Each of these options can be desired by us for different reasons and in different ways, but nonetheless desired. If they are not, I'm maintaining that we cannot choose them, since it's impossible to choose an action for which we have no desire, no emotional inclination, to which we are totally indifferent or even from every point of view averse. Well, let me illustrate this with a somewhat trivial, actually it's not only somewhat trivial, it's really trivial uh, <laughs> example, but one that's useful, I hope. Suppose four alternative actions are theoretically possible objects for my choice. The situation is this. I happen to have a piece of cake, and I'm faced with four options for action in its regard. I can eat my cake. I can keep it, preserve it for another time. I can give it away, or I can bury it in the ground. Now, I ha I'm going to use low-tech <laughs> visuals here. I had intended to learn how to do a PowerPoint before I gave these lectures, but I gave it up a, a week or so ago. <laughs> All right, so here are my options. I can eat my cake. I can keep it. I can give it away. And I can bury it in the ground. Now, I have a desire, an inclination, a tending toward <laughs> eating my cake now because I'm hungry or because I want the pleasure of eating it now. I likewise have a tendency, a desire, a tending toward keeping my cake, preserving it, because I want to prolong the pleasure of uh, anticipating the eating of it tonight. Or I know I'll enjoy it more this evening than I would now. I also have an inclination, attending toward giving my cake away, because I have encountered someone whom I perceive to be more hungry than I am, and for whom I have compassion or in relation to whom I feel drawn by friendship or duty. But I have no inclination whatsoever to bury my cake in the ground. And what I'm suggesting is that makes it impossible for me to have this as one of my options for choice. Now, of course, you could say, well, here, I'll think of a way where you, well, well, that's fine. You think of a way that I have an inclination. All right, that, that uh, proves my point rather than disproves it. Uh, but anyway, do, do, do you see what I'm saying here? I cannot choose the fourth option. It is not a viable option for me, at least not at this time and in these circumstances. Only the first three 
actions can be potential objects of choice. Take another example. Suppose I am confronted with the alternative actions of enduring courageously in a dangerous situation or running away. If I am, on the one hand, inclined to have a desire to be courageous and endure the situation because, let it say, my reputation is at stake or because a person is involved for whom I care and who needs my help in this situation. Or I see it simply as the right thing to do. And on the other hand, I also am inclined to run away because I'm afraid for my life or because I know my life is important for someone else and so forth. Both of these alternative actions are possible objects for choice. I have an inclination toward both of them. Insofar as this analysis is accurate, a profoundly important aspect of human freedom emerges. If we can choose only actions for which we have prior inclinations or desires, that is prior to choice, we begin to see that free choice is not only between our own actions to be done, it is a choice between our very desires to act and our very reasons for acting. Actions to be done are, prior to choice, only possibilities. Desires and reasons for these actions are, prior to choice, already actual. And they, that is the desires and reasons, are both, along with potential actions, elements in the object of choice. What is at stake then in free choice is not only our actions, but the desires and thoughts within us. Now, take this off. I'm going to try to diagram as we go the, each of the elements that I identify. So, and if anybody's taking notes, I'm going to be moving that way. So, <laughs> so here's action. Action to be done. Action one, action two. And I've just added another element, which is desire, or inclination, or whatever you want to call it. That both of these are present in the object of choice. Both of these will be chosen, both elements will be chosen, if I do make a choice between these two options. Understanding that a free agent's own desires are elements of the objects for choice opens the way to a further level of analysis of this object. The opening appears when we ask the following question. If, in making a free choice, we always choose an action of our own for which we have some desire, where does the desire come from? We might respond to this question in terms of our personal histories. For example, the desire comes from my learning as a child the importance of duty, or from long years in a relationship which has made me cherish the relationship, and so on, depending on what the options are. In either case, this constitutes significant information for coming to self-understanding in decision-making. But such explanations do not by themselves fully account for the particular desires in an object of choice. The reason for this is that desires are partial affective responses. By themselves, here and now, they are not only incomplete, but finally unintelligible and impossible. Without understanding the more radical affections on which desires depend and out of which they rise. Desire is an emotion 
a form of affectivity that is not self-explanatory. The question can always be asked about a desire, but why do you desire this? Or why do you desire to do this action? The ultimate answer is not in how I learned of its importance, but in for whom or for what I desire this. Why I want to eat my cake, for example, is not only that I learned to like the taste of this kind of cake, I want to eat this piece of cake for me, for my enjoyment, or to fill my own need for nourishment. I desire to eat the cake because I desire satisfaction or nourishment, but when I ask further why I desire these, the final answer is not in yet another desire. Nor does it make sense to say because I desire myself. It does make sense to say because I love and care for myself. Or in an alternate example, I love and care for another. Desire as an affective inclination, a leaning toward, can, of course, be of an end or a means to an end. Suppose I desire to give a gift to a friend in order to make her happy. I desire the action of giving the gift as a means to her happiness. I, des I desire her happiness as an end for her, assuming I have no ulterior motive. Desire for the means is, as such, completely relative, of course, to desire for the end. Sometimes we speak about the desired end as for its own sake. And it is true that within an order or a chain of desired objects, what is called the end of, the, I desire this, it, I'm moving this way, but if I desire this, I desire to, to, because I desire this, because I desire this, one of the desires is going to be the last one in the chain of desires. It is, it, we call it terminal. It's a goal, the final object to be desired in this particular chain of desires. But there is another kind of end, which is not within the order of desires at all. It is what a whole chain of rela related desires is for. In this example that I just gave, the end in a much deeper sense is my friend. But my affective response to my friend is not desire, although there may be more desires related to her, such as a desire to be with her, in which case my ultimate end may not be my friend uh, at all, but myself. Ultimately, though, we arrive at someone or something for whom the means and ends are desired, but who is not herself desired, but loved. It is this, I'm using the term love, I understand all these terms, you think, I mean, just let's use it for now, anyway. <laughs> and, and I'm not putting limits on what it means either, I'm not talking about agape, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about a, a more radical kind of affective response. It is this more ultimate kind of end, the object of love, not desire, that is the source and the ground of desire and that provides desire's intelligibility. Love, as I just said, is a more radical affection than desire. Radical in the sense radix, it is a root, a root affection out of which other forms of affection arise. Desire, fear, hope, aversion, care. Love is at once, as I'm using it, is at once an affective response to what is perceived as lovable 
and an affective union with what is loved, and an affective affirmation whereby I place my being or a part of it, an aspect of it, in affirmation of who or what I love. To say I love you is different from just saying I know you. If I say I love you, I'm saying not just you are, but I want you to be. Every choice, then, is a choice not only of my action, not only of my, let's see here, um, well, anyway, not only of my desire, but a choice of a given love. So we may have this, des uh, this desire comes out of this desire. We may have a whole chain of desirings, but what I'm saying is that ultimately, all the desires are because I love someone or something. So this gives rise to this. This makes this possible as an option for choice. Indeed, it is the love and its object that is the direct, the central, the most basic object of choice. Since desire depends on it and implements it, an action remains potential unless and until it is activated by both love and desire. Loves, of course, or radical affections, can themselves be complex. For, as we know, they can be conditional or unconditional, relative or absolute, a response to need in the form of care, or a response to the valuable object that is in need. Had we the time to press more deeply in considering love as the central affection at the heart of an act of choice, we could, I believe, come to see that every, in other words, here, I could spread this, all I've said, I could have multiple desires. Similarly, I could have conditional love based in an unconditional love. I could have relative love uh, in, in some way uh, related to an absolute love and so on. I'm going to return to those possibilities on Thursday, not today. For now, having described in broad strokes, very broad strokes, the affections that are within the object of choice, an analysis of objects of choice is not yet complete. What remains in terms of other elements in the manifold object of choice, free choice, however, can, I think, be identified fairly quickly. As should be obvious by now, the affections of human desire and love have a cognitive element within them. Love, for example, is receptive of, united with, and affirming of the beloved. It is not only awakened, but released, and it is shaped by the beloved, the object of love. But this means that it is awakened, specified, shaped through the perception and knowledge of its object. And once love as affirmation exists in us, affirmation of what is love, whether in relation to our neighbor or something else in creation or ourselves or God, we are moved to desire actions for the sake of the beloved. Awakened and moved through knowledge of what is loved, and knowledge of what is desirable for the one loved, we can assess our loves, our desires, our potential actions, discerning the justification or at least explanation of their objects and the appropriateness of the love, its desires, and its deeds. All of these cognitive actions, perception, apprehension, insights, evaluative just judgments, are included also among the elements in the object of choice. So, we have to put knowledge here as a factor in all of these. And we also 
have to put evaluative judgment, assessment, appraisals, whatever you want to call them, of all of this. All of this goes on in choosing what we choose. If I shift language for a moment, it might help to clarify what I've been saying about affections, knowledge, and judgment. Let me speak, therefore, in terms of motives and reasons for choice all the while attempting to make the same point I have been making regarding affective and cognitive elements in the object of choice. And by the way, uh, just to hold it together, see there are two options here. So we have all of this all also in this second alternative option. As well as the judgments. A motive, in general, is a conscience, conscious influence which moves us to respond effectively, or which, when responded to effectively, moves us to some further action. We do speak of unconscious motives, of course, but, and these are of great interest to everybody, especially to clinical psychologists, but uh, I'm talking about conscious motives here. Everything that I, I said to start out with, we're, we're, we're exploring the conscious experience of free choice. So I'm not saying, well, if we go way down here into the iceberg, there'll be this. And I, maybe so, but it's not what I'm dealing with. Right? I'm not, what is actual in my conscious awareness? So, an, an example, when I hear from a friend telling me of some sadness or fear in his life, I am moved by my love for my friend to respond with care, to desire an action that will um, relate to the needs of the friend whom I love. I'm moved by my love for my friend to respond with care, which in turn moves me to desire to encourage my friend. And this desire moves me to, say, telephone my friend, offering solace or solidarity or whatever may be a source of his encouragement. Each of these affective responses, affective actions, and their and their objects, are motives, one leading to the other. And of course, it distorts everything for me to put it up there flat on a board. This goes on inside us, inside us. It's not splayed out in some linear fashion like this. Reason, on the other hand, in the context of choice, signifies what justifies, or at least explains, a motive or an action whether internal, affective, and cognitive actions and their objects, or a potential action to be done. Reasons shape evaluative judgments about our actual loves and our desires and our potential actions to be done. So mo uh, motives and reasons are commonly used as terms in discussions of choice. They are not commonly discussed as part of what must be chosen. So I'm trying to set this up so that here is an object of choice, and here is an object of choice, and my choice is going to be between the alternatives but not just of the action, but the whole package is what's chosen. Sometimes reasons and motives, especially motives, are pitted against the possibility of free choice. As in someone says, oh, but look at the motives he had in doing that action. 
as if having a motive always compromised freedom of choice. What I'm trying to suggest, however, is that motives and reasons, loves, desires, apprehensions, evaluative judgments are, in fact, among the elements in the content of what is chosen, in the object of choice. They, along with a potential action to be done, are what is chosen in an act of free choice. We do not choose in spite of motives and reasons, unless, I'll give examples later, if, if one is stronger than the other, then you don't have a choice. But if it is a choice, if a choice is really possible here, we do not choose in spite of motives and reasons, we choose among alternative motives and reasons themselves. Finally, we can discover at least two other elements in the object of choice. The first correlates with elements of reason, in particular with evaluative judgments. Judgments of the value of what one loves, the value and prudential orientation of what one desires, the appropriateness and justice of an action to be done, such judgments are made on the basis of some criteria, some norms. Now, each alternative object of choice holds, then, not only all the elements I've already identified, but it holds the norms. It holds the criteria whereby I make these judgments. So the norms are going to be operative here in each. And I'm going to have one norm is going to make this look like I should choose it, and another norm is going to make this like I should choose it. And I'm ultimately going to have to make a choice about which norm or which set of norms I'm going to let move us all the way to action. If we are to have objects that can be chosen, we must have reasons for, for preferring one over the others. If these reasons depend on judgments, they must each be judged in some way preferable according to different criteria or norms. Hence, a choice between or among these objects will include a choice of norms or criteria. For example, suppose a woman is looking for a job. She has two offers, one, job A, that pays more than the other but would not be as enjoyable for her. Another, job B, that would be extremely enjoyable because it's in a field in which she's skilled and which she has found to be rewarding in the past, but it pays much less than the first one. Each of these positions would be satisfactory, she thinks, but the criteria on the basis of which she prefers one or the other are clearly different. If her primary criterion is the amount of her salary, either because the larger salary would make her life easier or because it would allow her to provide more adequately for one of her children who has special needs. She will choose job A, pays more. If her primary criterion is the rewarding and life-enhancing nature of the work, she will choose job B. These two objects are objects for choice because they're held in tension. So the question in making the choice is, which criterion will finally be primary, which, according to which norm, which way of assessing this uh, will I choose? The criteria or norms in each of these objects do not simply cancel one another out. She must choose between them. Now, of course, if she gets a third offer, job C, which pays as much as job A and is as enjoyable as job B, she no longer has a choice to make. Nothing's in tension with anything. She now has an, an option that, straight on, that's it. She has no longer a viable choice to make. The second additional element in some objects of choice relates only to moral choices. That is, choices that involve experiences of moral obligation and judgments with norms that are moral norms. Since I'm going to address these questions, of moral obligation, moral norms, moral judgments in objects of choice in my final lecture on Thursday, I bracket them for now. We have, however, 
seen enough about objects of choice to consider some of what can be learned from them regarding the act of choosing itself. And I said, we, we did the object of choice now, which tells us something about what it means to choose. So I'm moving from the object to the choice, the act of choosing. Of the many things we already know about the act of free choice, the first is, as I've said several times, that it requires alternatives. That is, it requires alternative objects between or among which we can choose. I'm going to qualify that statement next week, but for now, I'm saying that. If there is only one object, without even the alternatives of doing and not doing a given potential action, and if the love, desire, and judgments all, without anything else deflecting them, spontaneously lead to one action, there's no need or possibility of choice. Even if there are two or more complex objects, but there's no tension between them, no pull on the e agent to each of them, no split in the agent's affectivity in their regard, then there's no need for choice and no non-necessary possibility of choice will simply be the strongest desire, the strongest affection, will determine what we do. Similarly, if our process of, processes of intellectual discernment reveal what is clearly the most convincing judgment, the right answer to whatever our previous quandaries, and it is not blocked or in tension with conflicting desires or loves or other judgments, then this right answer will determine what we do. An intellectual decision will settle the matter, not a free choice. However, if tension remains between alternatives for choice, whether affective or cognitive tensions or both, then it must be resolved either by averting our eyes, determining it's not worth the effort to continue trying to resolve the tension between these competing alternatives, so we just stand still. Or by making a choice. The next insight we already have about the act of choosing is, as I've already not noted that also before, that the affections, cognitions, judgments within each alternative object are themselves already actual. See, the action is just possible until a choice is made. It's potential. All of this and all of this is already there. It's actual. Both are in us, in a sense. Our choice is not to create a love or create new judgments, etc. When you get to the point of choice, I mean, you have to work at getting judgments and figuring out your loves and all that sort of thing. But when you're there with them as objects of choice, they are not being creative, created. Prior to choice, prior to choice, they exist. They are already part of us. This means that what exists within objects of choice is already determined, at least for now, by past and present influences, whether processes in the brain, external influences, ordinary encounters in the world, or even our own past choices. The desires I have described as elements within the object of choice are spontaneous, unfree, rising necessarily out of love, inclining necessarily to potential actions. Also, we do not choose to initiate in the first instance a love. It awakens spontaneously in response to what is loved. It presents itself to our freedom particularly when we find it in some form of tension with another actual love. Hence, prior to choice, already determined and determining forces account for the elements in the object of choice. They are there, in a sense, waiting to be chosen if the conditions are conducive. Without these elements, without some prior determination of our loves, desires, knowledge, judgment, we would have nothing to choose. So determination is not always in opposition to free choice. You can't have it 
without some determination, something that's already determined. This leads to a third insight into what it means to choose the act of deciding, of choosing one option between two or many, is a double-sided act. On the one hand, it is an act of ratifying one of the options. So let's say here, my, choice, my choice is of this or this. Put it right in the middle if you want. And I choose this. The act of choosing is on one side the act of ratifying this love, these judgments, this desire, and letting them issue in action. Affirming the love and the desire and the judgment that constitute this option in a way that allows issuance into this action. On the other hand, choice is an act of repudiating the other options, not letting them issue in action, but letting them go. We ratify only one of the ob objects of a particular choice. And in so doing, we ratify, identify with, as I said before, the whole package, the manifold of love, desire, knowledge, action that constitutes the object of choice that we choose. This sometimes means that once and for all, we choose to let the repudiated objects go. We really cannot have our cake and eat it too. And sometimes to take one road means we will lose forever the opportunity to take others. Sometimes, however, it means only that in this circumstance, under these conditions, as we choose to prefer one object over the other, we simultaneously choose not to repudiate, but to defer the others. For example, a parent may love each of his children and be ready to do the deeds of love for them as they are needed, appropriate, possible. Yet on a given day, on a given occasion, priority will be given to one child because of illness, special celebration of a milestone, or particular need. In such a choice, there is no final repudiation of the in this situation, by this choice, unratified, unchosen loves of the other children. There is only a deferring of particular ratifications that will be made in other ways at other times and in other circumstances. And even the term defer is not adequate, it seems to me, because we can make choices in which both loves continue one explicitly, one implicitly, but we, do, we, cannot, um, we cannot let them both issue in action because the actions are a part of objects of choice precisely because they're mutually uh, incompatible. We are still, after all, in search well, there's more that we can say about the nature of an act of choice as well as its meaning. I'm coming close to the end here. We are still, after all, in search of an answer to the question raised in my first lecture. But is it really free, this action that we call free choice? Is it free in the sense that the agent in some way and in some measure acts not only independently of external duress or, or coercion or influence, but independently of the reasons and motives in the objects of, tro of choice. Is it free in the sense that the agent really could do otherwise? What I mean by that is, I mean, if these necessitate going to an action, there's not going to be a free choice. There's only a free choice if they're held in tension and one will be ratified and the other deferred or rep repudiated, let go. If not, that is, if not, it's not free in the sense that the agent really could do otherwise, then everything about the act of choice will already be determined by the previously determined elements in the object of choice or by whatever else is already determined within the agent or by outside forces. We still make choices that aren't free choices. I mean, animals make choices all the time, don't they? 
uh, as far as I know, they're not free choices. I don't know, but uh, if they if they don't have this capacity for self-reflection, and uh, and the possibility of really more than one option, we wouldn't call. We'd say they select, or they they. Um, uh, they follow the line of least resistance or whatever, or instinct or whatever. The strongest affective action or inclination and or the most convincing evaluative judgment will prevail unless they could do otherwise. Or whatever, you put another, or whatever I have become will completely determine what I will be and become in the future. There will be nothing new under the sun, since every action will be explainable in terms of its past. On the other hand, if the agent is not necessitated to act by the reasons and motives in the object of choice, or by whatever other force, does this mean that she chooses randomly, without reasons, good or bad, without taking account of the significance of her loves and desires, without any rationale, whatever. This seems hardly the case, especially if we think freedom of choice is one of our most distinctive and important characteristics as human beings. And what I've been trying to show is that human free choice is not necessitated by prior reasons and motives, yet it is not without reasons and motives. It is an action that determines which of the reasons and motives and their objects it will identify with. Well, we have then our glimpses. By reason of my choices, I am the owner of my chosen actions. I choose because I choose. The act of freedom is wholly reflexive. It is a, dis it is a possessing of ourselves while we determine ourselves in some way, in some measure. It is self-initiating. It has no infinite regress, though it does not take place in a vacuum. What is already within us as objects, in objects of choice is embraced by us and given a future, or it is rejected, deferred, repudiated by us, and thereby also modifying our future. We determine and are, in part, determined by ourselves. We identify ourselves, in part, with loves that we choose, and we determine them, not others, to move us to a particular action. We thereby govern our acts and ourselves, more or less, and also more or less well. We are ourselves responsible, and choice accomplishes something so that I, who am already someone, formed but not necessitated in the face of some particular sets of options, become in some way new. This is a unique dimension of personal subjectivity in all its possibility and depth. There are several other learnings we may ponder about the act of free choice. I leave them to my final lecture and to the more explicit introduction there of theological considerations. For now, I end with simply this. <clears throat> Insofar as freedom of choice is possible to us, it represents the real, though limited, power to render ourselves, our loves, our judgments, our desires, effective in action. It depends on what is already given yet it allows us to transcend what is given. It introduces the new, yet provides continuity with what already is. However we have come to be where we are, freedom is the capacity to reaffirm ourselves or to change in whatever limited degree and for whatever new or sustained loves are offered to us for choice. Thank you.